So we'll uh, today uh, discuss about the packet uh, scheduling algorithms for providing uh, quality of service guarantees uh, in internet. Uh, till uh, today, you know, we have been considering that uh, various flows when they share uh, the buffer at a particular router or a statistical multiplexer, then there is one common buffer where all the flows are sharing the, uh, this common buffer and there may be a packet scheduler which schedules these packets in the first in first out manner. Okay? So let me just see what uh, uh, is the scenario that we have been considering till now. Scenario that we have been considering is that there is a one single buffer and all the uh, you know internet flows are sharing this buffer and this buffer uh, may be scheduling the packets uh, maybe in a first in uh, first out uh, manner. Now for the time being let us consider that uh, we are uh, not uh, concerned about providing specific quality of service guarantees uh, to the flows but let us say that at least we want that these various flows when they share uh, one common output link then they get what we call as a fair share of the bandwidth okay we will shortly define what is meant by a fair share of the bandwidth and so on okay but let us consider that these flows which are sharing this single common buffer are the tcp flows okay so basically you know what we are saying is that that all of these are let us say are, are tcp flows okay now these TCP flows are sharing one common buffer and the scheduler is scheduling okay, the packets in the first, down first, uh, first in first out manner. Okay. So we would like to know that what are the problems with these scheduling disciplines. Okay. So towards that uh, we should know that the TCP has a specific congestion control technique. Okay. The TCP's congestion control technique is based on what is called as uh, additive increase and multiplicative decrease additive increase and multiplicative decrease what does it mean it means that the tcp uh, increases its window size in an additive fashion after the receipt of an acknowledgement okay so when the tcp sends packets worth its window size okay and when as and when the tcp you know uh, keeps on receiving the acknowledgement it it slides the window and it increases the window size in an additive fashion when the tcp's congestion control mechanism detects the packet loss then the window drops okay to half of its previous size or it drops to one you know depending upon various versions of the uh, tcps that are being used and the various types of congestion control algorithms that are being deployed but the basic principle is that the increase is in an additive fashion and the decrease is in a multiplicative fashion typically you know if you see the window evolution okay then this window evolution of the tcp will follow a sawtooth pattern that it increases uh, you know uh, in an additive fashion and it whenever it detects a packet loss the window size drops to one or maybe the window size may be dropping to half depending upon the versions that are used okay now note that for the acknowledgement uh, it takes about uh, one round trip time uh, okay the packets need to go from the sender to the receiver and then the acknowledgements need to travel from the uh, receiver to the sender therefore this increase of the window size or this decrease of the window size okay uh, it can happen uh, 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 at an interval of the uh, the round trip times okay now therefore what happens that when these multiple tcp flows like this are sharing a single common buffer it might be quite possible that these sources of these tcp flows okay have varying round trip times okay between their destinations okay so these tcp flows are having varying round trip times and let us assume that this of our node is a congested or what we call as a uh, bottleneck node or a congested node okay so uh, as a result you know when these tcp flows are having varying round trip times okay then this 
congestion control mechanisms okay will be biased towards you know those connections which are having shorter round trip times okay the tcp's congestion control mechanism of additive increase and multiplicative decrease is biased towards those flows which have uh, shorter round trip times why because if the flow has a shorter round trip times it ramps up to its available capacity okay very fast and when it detects the packet loss when the bottleneck node is congested it drops its window size to one but then it ramps up again uh, very fast on the other hand the flows which are having larger round trip times they respond to the congestion conditions um, uh, uh, and then ramp up their uh, window size uh, uh, you know uh, uh, proportionate uh, uh, to its round trip time so if it is large so the increase is little slow so therefore the AIMT method is biased towards connections with the uh, shorter round trip times as a result what happens when these TCP flows are sharing a single buffer at a node which is scheduling the packets as a first in first out uh, manner then obviously the flows with uh, shorter round trip times are likely to have an unfair share of the bottleneck bandwidths okay so this is this is one aspect of when the various flows are sharing a common uh, buffer then we would like to know whether these each of these flows are getting a fair share of the output link bandwidth even if these are not tcp flows even if these are not tcp flows some of these flows could be the non tcp flows also and suddenly they may uh, start transmitting a large number of packets okay now if they transmit the large number of packets and congest the link then the packets will get dropped and the tcp in response to this packet drop will drop its window size but on the other hand the non responsive flows may not drop the packets and keep transmitting the packets as a result hogging the bandwidth and getting an unfair share of the link bandwidth so the question therefore is that that we need to segregate you know these flows into various queues and then schedule the packets in such a manner that each of these flows gets a fair share of the link bandwidth essentially it means that we need to go to some kind of a non first in first out or non first come first serve kind of a scheduling techniques okay so for uh, for both you know for protecting the flows from misbehaving users or non responsive users as well as for the users giving a fair share of the link bandwidth we need some kind of a uh, you know uh, fair scheduling disciplines and then we will also see you know how we can provide the specific quality of service guarantees like the delay or the delay jitters to these uh, various flows okay so today you know we will see that how we can design scheduling disciplines you know that meets our objective of providing fairness to various flows which are sharing our router link as well as you know protecting these links from the misbehaving or non responsive flows or even non responsive protocols like the udp or the constant bitrate uh, uh, flows or the C cbr uh, traffic let us say in an atm switch okay so we will discuss uh, today about you know those scheduling disciplines right now uh, you know let me just uh, uh, discuss about this various scheduling disciplines okay what are the functions of the scheduling algorithms okay so functions of uh, scheduling what what do you, what we mean by the scheduling algorithms okay now it has two orthogonal components okay one you know it decides the order of service okay and second it manages the queue of packets okay so there are two orthogonal components of a scheduling algorithm you decide the order of servicing the packet that in which order you want to service the packet and secondly you will manage the queues of various packets now various objectives you know uh, uh, the a scheduling algorithm need to satisfy one as we have just spoken 
is we would like to uh, schedule the packets in such a manner that each of these flows gets a fair share of the link bandwidth as well as uh, you know they are protected uh, you know from the misbehaving users. Secondly, we would also like to have some kind of a network level quality of service guarantees in terms of the delay bounds, in terms of the uh, bandwidth, in terms of the uh, delay jitter. So, these kind of quality of service guarantees we would like to give uh, through the scheduling algorithms. And secondly, we would like to have some kind of hierarchical link sharing. By hierarchical link sharing, we mean that there may be a link which may be shared by uh, you know let us say multiple departments of an organization and uh, so in that department uh, so so basically that output link bandwidth which you may have to a service provider that is being shared between multiple departments in a fa fair manner and then within each department there may be multiple applications where you know this link bandwidth uh, may be shared so as a result uh, you know, we are sharing the link bandwidth in a hierarchical fashion uh, through the uh, scheduling uh, disciplines. Okay, so uh, these are the three objectives that a scheduling discipline uh, has to meet. Then uh, the uh, the scheduling algorithms can also be a work conserving scheduling algorithms, or it can be a non-work conserving scheduling algorithms. Okay, so the scheduling algorithms can be work conserving. and non work conserving. What is a work conserving scheduling algorithm? In a work conserving scheduling algorithm, a server is never idle if there are packets in the queue. It always serves packets if there are non empty queues. On the other hand, in a non work conserving scheduling algorithm, even if there are packets in the queue, a server may be idle. Okay. The question of course is that why one would like to have a non-work conserving scheduling algorithm because a non-work conserving scheduling algorithm it seems will wait even if there are packets in the queue and therefore wasting the link bandwidth. So why we would like to have such a scheduling algorithms? We will see later on in the discussions on the work non-work conserving scheduling algorithms that sometimes it may be desirable to use non work conserving scheduling algorithms to regulate let us say the burstiness of the output streams okay you we may like uh, to regulate the burstiness of the output stream because otherwise if you schedule these packets then you know the downstream nodes may receive bursty inputs okay so we may like to regulate this so to achieve this objective we might want to have a non work conserving scheduling algorithms. Non work conserving scheduling algorithms can also be used to control the delay jitter. Okay. To achieve you know these kind of objectives, sometimes it may be necessary for the server to remain idle even if there are packets in the queues and that is why you know uh, we call such scheduling algorithm as non work conserving. For the time being for most of these discussions. Uh, in this lecture and the subsequent uh, lectures okay we will concentrate mostly on the work conserving scheduling disciplines however i will take a uh, few examples of non work conserving disciplines also and we'll try to illustrate where uh, they can be used in the uh, actual routers okay so now let us see uh, the uh, work conserving uh, scheduling algorithms only for the time being right now uh, uh, in the work conserving scheduling algorithm, uh, uh, interestingly, uh, there is uh, this uh, scheduling conservation loss. Okay, so that is what I would like to illustrate. Okay, which we call it the scheduling Klein-Rocks. It's a Klein-Rocks scheduling conservation law. Now, first thing we should know that the first come first serve scheduling algorithms 
okay where we are uh, we were considering earlier that there is one single buffer and multiple flows are sharing this buffer and the packets are being served in the first in first out manner such first come first serve scheduling algorithms cannot differentiate between different connections okay so if you have to give fairness if you have to give protections if you have to give quality of service guarantees then we must resort to non first come first serve scheduling algorithms okay so by the non first come first serve scheduling algorithms we mean that we have different queues for different flows so let's say one to n flows are sharing these different flows and then there is a scheduler which is trying to schedule you know the various packets out of these queues okay and uh, may try to give uh, you know a certain quality of service guarantees however if this scheduling algorithm if this scheduler is a is a worth conserving scheduler then we have a very important klein rocks conservation law okay so what's that klein rocks conservation law now this states let's say rho i is equal to lambda i x i okay now let's say lambda i is the arrival rate for the ith connections okay so lambda i is the arrival rate for the ith connections and uh, let us say that uh, x i is the mean service time Is, is lambda i is the mean arrival rate and x i is the mean service time of uh, of uh, ith connections okay and lambda i is the is is, is the mean arrival rate or the average arrival rate of i so lambda i x i okay uh, gives you okay the rho i and the rho i we call it to be the uh, mean utilization of the link due to i okay now let's say that qi okay is the is the queuing time average queuing delay of ith connections okay then the klein rocks conservation law states that the sum of rho i q i is going to be a constant all right so what does it say that suppose we have a uh, non first come first serve scheduler where there are multiple connections each of the connections let us say is having a queue and these queues are being served by a work conserving scheduler now these queues could be virtual or physical in a practical systems so we are not right now bothered but let us say that there are n such queues let's say that in an ith queue lambda i is the average arrival rate and xi is the average service time then lambda i into xi denotes the mean utilization of the link to the ith connection okay now what the klein rocks conservation law is stating is a sum of the mean utilization due to the ith connections multiplied by its queuing time okay and the sum over all such connections is going to remain constant what is the significance of this the significance of this is that if you want to reduce the queuing time or queuing delay of some connection okay let us say that of the ith connection you want to reduce its queuing delay that is qi you want to reduce okay so here you know this qi 
you want to reduce. Now, if you want to reduce this QI, it can only happen okay, at the expense of an increase okay, the, of the delay of the other connections. Okay. Because the sum of the mean utilization multiplied by the Q in time is going to remain constant over when sum taken over all connections. Okay. We can give lower delays or lower bandwidths to other connections only at the expense of an increase in the delay okay, uh, of the other connections. Okay. So, we can, we can give lower delays to the other connections at the expense of an increase in delay of the other connections. Essentially, what it is mean is that utilization times the delay, okay, uh, this is gets conserved. Okay. So, you can only play, you know, between the delays of the different packets. Okay. Uh, this sum, however, is going to remain constant over uh, the all connections. Okay. Now, this is important because uh, what does it mean is that you cannot arbitrarily schedule connections uh, having arbitrary delay uh, or bandwidth requirements. Okay. We need to then see that whether you know a particular set of delay vectors and the uh, and the average arrival rate or the utilization vectors whether they are schedulable under the work conserving scheduling disciplines or not because you know we have the klein rocks conservation law uh, in place. So, this is very important what does it try to say is that uh, we cannot design a work conserving scheduling algorithm to give arbitrary delays and arbitrary bandwidth guarantees you know to various flows. Uh, we can only do that with a non work conserving scheduling algorithms because in a non work conserving scheduling algorithms a server will remain idle okay if there even if there are packets in the queues and as a result you know in order uh, to give a uh, you know it, it it can therefore essentially uh, you know decouple the delay uh, and the bandwidth uh, guarantees in this case the delay and the bandwidth guarantees you know in some sense are coupled however note that it, it, uh, you know typically in a non work conserving scheduling discipline the average queuing delay suffered by connection will always be higher than the queuing delays uh, uh, than the average queuing delays in a work conserving uh, scheduling disciplines okay uh, so what what therefore we see now in the work conserving scheduling algorithms uh, is uh, the bandwidth and the delay guarantees are coupled and at the same time the conservation law uh, holds good okay so so this is one uh, important factor in the design of a uh, non fcfs uh, scheduling algorithms right now let us move forward and let us try to see uh, what are the various attributes of a uh, scheduling disciplines okay, uh, that we would uh, want to have what are these uh, you know various attributes. So, so basically you know our objective is to design a work conserving uh, work conserving scheduling algorithms uh, where, uh, and uh, uh, which, 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 which operates under the principles of the uh, this conservation law, but we would like to know now what are the other attributes of the scheduling algorithms. Okay. One is we would like to have implementation simplicity. I will just elaborate on that. Second, we would like to have fairness. I mean, this is the objective with which we really started uh, this topic of fairness and the uh, flow isolation. And thirdly, we would like to have the algorithms which are scalable, scalability. We need to provide the QoS and we need to have uh, simple admission control algorithm. Now, let us look at the point of the implementation simplicity. Okay. If you look at the implementation uh, simplicity, then the scheduling algorithms must be very simple to implement. Okay. Now, 
uh, in order to give the quality of service guarantees to the various flows, uh, we cannot afford to have the scheduling algorithms uh, uh, very complicated. Now, to give you an idea, uh, if you really want to do uh, the, take this scheduling discipline, scheduling decisions in a fast manner, then it really depends upon how much time is available for the scheduler to take a decision depending upon the packet input rates. Okay. So, you know that uh, uh, thing must be kept in mind in devising a scheduling algorithms. Okay. So, note that what we are essentially having is that in a non first come first serve scheduler there are various going to be various flows okay. and here is going to be a scheduler. Now, this scheduler needs to take a decision which one of these packets it will pick up okay, for transmission on the output link to satisfy the objectives of the fairness and the quality of service guarantees. Okay. So, the scheduler has to take a decision which one of these packets uh, you know it, it needs to pick up. Now, this decision the scheduling discipline must take within certain time budget. Okay. Now, what is that time budget available? Now, that time budget available will depend upon what is the input arrival rate to these various queues. Okay, uh, so that the scheduling uh, algorithm takes a decision fast uh, uh, in a line rate manner. Okay, uh, so 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 that is one aspect of the implementation simplicity. You know, the scheduling algorithm must not do lots of computations in order to determine which one of these packets you know it should pick up for the transmissions. Uh, of course, one would argue that with the present day VLSI implementations uh, these days uh, you know you can implement a very complex uh, logic uh, of computing you know which one of these packets to pick up for transmissions. Okay. So, however, when we say that uh, the implementation simplicity of course, it depends upon the time budget, but it also depends upon the amount of scheduling state which this algorithm needs to store in order to take a decision. Why? Because these scheduling states will need to be stored in a memory and if these scheduling states are large, okay, then of course, it needs to be stored in some memory which needs to be outside the chip and if it is outside the chip, the access time will be large and therefore, you know, the time required to compute uh, the decision will also be large. As a result, typically, we would like to store this scheduling state on an on on chip memory to reduce the access time and and therefore you know uh, the scheduling uh, states the number of scheduling states in a particular scheduling algorithms should also be small so that is you know one aspect of uh, an implementation simplicity in order that the algorithm can scale also the number of operations that are required should be independent of the number of connections that are there that means it should be independent of of this n okay for the implementation simplicity your scheduling algorithm should be independent of m typically we would like to have uh, the uh, scheduling dis uh, scheduling operations okay the the operations required in the scheduling algorithms of uh, order 1 you know we do not want them to be order n. If they are order n then the algorithm will not scale because typically in a core routers the number of connections can be as large as 100,000 or 200,000 uh, flows and if there are 100,000, 200,000 that kind of uh, uh, flows then obviously uh, the number of scheduling operations will not scale you know if the number of scheduling operations uh, are scaling order n. Okay. So, therefore, we would like to have the scheduling operations independent of the number of connections that are there. Uh, uh, the, the number of scheduling states which an algorithm has to store should be smaller and, uh, uh, and the overall number of computations or operations that are required to do should also be small so that it fits within the time budget. So, uh, by implementation simplicity we mean that a scheduling algorithm should not only have uh, you know less number of operations to compute, but also should require less memory. So, that will make an implementation of a scheduling algorithm simpler that is one thing. Uh, second thing is uh, um, uh, the fairness, uh, fairness and the flow isolations. Of course, the scheduling algorithms uh, should be fair okay, uh, and uh, 
uh, as we have already seen earlier itself that uh, the TCP flows, the TCP's congestion control algorithms is biased towards connections with shorter round trip times and therefore we need a mechanism at the router which can give each TCP flow uh, a fair share of the output link bandwidth and at the same time it can protect these TCP flows from, from non-responsive flows like UDPs or some misbehaving uh, you know uh, sources. So the scheduling algorithms you know must provide uh, uh, fairness and uh, must provide you know some kind of flow isolations. Now of course this question is there that what do you mean by fairness okay. Uh, this this obviously uh, a question. Now we we will talk fairness in our discussion in the context of max min fairness. Okay, so let me just explain what is meant by max min fairness. Max min fairness. So, it actually means that we are maximizing the minimum fair share of the bandwidth. Right? Uh, how does it work? it works that it adopts three principles resources are allocated in the increasing order of their demands okay so we will allot the resources in the increasing order of their demands No user gets a share larger than its demands. And users whose demands are unsatisfied you know gets equal shares. Of course, you can give weights. So, we are assuming that the uh, uh, users uh, whose demands are not satisfied, uh, uh, they do not uh, have uh, uh, so, 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 uh, so, they are not indistinguishable in, a, in any other sense. However, if you allocate weights, then the users with unsatisfied demands will uh, will uh, will get uh, you know uh, uh, you know shares in proportion uh, to for, to their weights. Okay, so we are assuming here that the weights of all the users are one. Then the resources are allocated in the increasing order of their demand. No user will get a share larger than its demands, and users whose demands are not satisfied, uh, they will get you know equal shares. Uh, just to give you an example, let me just explain this uh, with an example. Suppose you know uh, there are users like uh, with demands like x1, x2, so on till xn, right? And uh, uh, obviously x1 plus uh, x2 plus xn, you know the sums of uh, these uh, uh, demand. Uh, now uh, these are let us say uh, the the bandwidths okay uh, which a user wants and let us say that we have a uh, total bandwidth uh, of uh, uh, let us say n okay the total bandwidth is n then obviously that there are n users and uh, and one would say that a fair share uh, would be that you give each of these uh, n users uh, 1 by n uh, bandwidth right right so we can give them uh, sort of uh, uh, 1 by n Obviously, one thing is there that the sum of these bandwidths, you know, uh, may be 
greater than n because their demands you know uh, it is possible that these you know xn's okay may be greater than 1 upon n so we have arranged them in in such a manner <coughs> that this x1 is less than x2 is less than x3 is so xn is the is the highest demand okay now we allocate each users let us say 1 by n now it turns out that x1 happens to be less than 1 upon n if x1 is less happens to be one, less than 1 upon n then we allocate to the first user the resource x1 only now if we allocate the resource x1 then we have a bandwidth available which will be 1 by n minus x1 this will be the extra bandwidth that gets available divide by n minus 1 okay this share we added to each of these users so now this share gets added okay to each of these users now again we take x2 and try to see whether x2 is greater than this or not okay if it turns out that x2 is less than this then obviously x3 xn all will be less than this and then the users all the users will get this however if x2 is greater than this then the user 2 will get only x2 okay and we subtract okay from this uh, x2 okay and then divide that equally among all the users okay so finally you know we will then achieve a fair share of the link bandwidth to all the users in the sense of max min fairness okay let me just give you an example let us say that there are uh, three users okay uh, and uh, the user one has a demand of uh, let us say five user two has a demand of uh, let us say eight and user uh, three has a demand of let us say uh, ten all right and let us say that uh, we have a total uh, resources of uh, uh, total resources of let us say that we have uh, uh, 20 uh, uh, let's say 18 total resources of 18 now if you divide 18 in 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 three users okay uh, in among the uh, three users okay uh, here of course I should assume that the total number of users are n and the link bandwidth was actually some kind of unity now if you divide this bandwidth uh, among three users then each user should get you know six six and six units all right but this user has a requirement which is less than six so this user will get only five and I have you know one left which I can divide them into equal parts okay and make them 6.5 and you know 6.5 now 6.5 turns out to be less than 8 and 6.5 turns out to be less than 10 now I can't do anything more than this so these users will be uh, stuck with 6.5 so so we satisfy you know this principles that uh, no user gets a share larger than its demand okay and users with unsatisfied demands get equal shares so if you see that these users you know users with 8 and 10 their demands are unsatisfied but they get equal shares of 6.5 6.5 so which is actually a fa of their fair share of the link bandwidth okay so this is what is called as that <coughs> we are allocating the resources in such a manner that we are maximizing the minimum share of the link bandwidth so we are allocating the resources in the sense of max min fairness okay so uh, one more thing which i would like to point out in terms of fairness is the typically the scheduling algorithm okay takes uh, uh, only the uh, locally fair decisions right because uh, you are there at a network node 
where uh, there are these non first come first serve schedulers and there are these various queues. So when a scheduler is scheduling these packets in such a manner to give a uh, fair share of the <coughs> link bandwidth to, to these users, it is taking a local decision. Now remember that these nodes are connected together in a network nodes and fairness is actually a global uh, objectives. Okay? The fairness really is a global objectives. Okay? Now it can be shown that if each uh, source uses okay, uh, uh, sticks to its smallest locally fair resource okay, available resource lo smallest locally fair resource then it will result in a globally fair allocation. So what we can show is that that if each connection or each flow limits uh, its resource usage to the smallest locally fair resource allocation. along its path it results and we are not going to prove this but I am just trying to uh, point out that in a network of nodes where the nodes are individually locally giving the fairness or ensuring the fairness and if a flow is going through several nodes if this flow restricts its resource allocation uh, its resource usage to the smallest locally fair available resource then overall in network of nodes it will result in a globally fair allocation okay now however the user usage pattern changes Okay, at, let us say at some nodes, uh, suddenly a source decreases its resource allocation, then it will increase the resource allocation, uh, resource usages of the other users. Now it will take certain time to propagate this allocations okay, to all the users. So in order that we maintain these globally fair objectives, okay, if the resource usages patterns are changing rapidly, you know, then it may be difficult to achieve a globally fair allocation. However, the uh, usage patterns are not changing rapidly, then each flow can ensure that it limits its resource usage to the smallest locally fair available resource allocation and then it can result in a globally fair allocation. Okay? So that is what uh, about the fairness aspects uh, which we want. Uh, typically, you know, if a scheduler is giving a fair allocation of the resources to each of its flows, then it is also ensuring protection from the misbehaving source. However, sometimes the converse may not be true. If you are providing protection by using some kind of a traffic regulators or shapers, okay, at the ingress to the scheduler. It does not mean that you will also give a fair allocation of the output link bandwidth to the flows. So therefore, while a scheduler is trying to be fair, it will automatically also ensure that it is protecting the other, it is protecting the flow from the other misbehaving users because that flow will definitely get a fair share of the link bandwidth. But if a node is protecting, uh, trying to ensure the protection by using some kind of rate limiting or you know some kind of uh, traffic shaping at the ingress point, then it does not mean that it will result in a maximum kind of fair allocation to uh, all the flows. Okay, so so that is what about the uh, sort of fairness. Uh, the third point that uh, we were trying to see is. Uh, uh, was of the scalability and that we have already seen that in order that a scheduling algorithm should be scalable, the scheduling uh, computations, the computations which are required for the scheduling algorithms 
must be independent of the number of connections that are uh, sharing the buffer and th that will make the scheduling algorithm uh, to be uh, scalable. We want to have the quality of service guarantees. Now, what are the quality of service guarantees? We want to give the delay bounds, we also want to give the delay jitter. Okay. Uh, we will see that it, it, it may be difficult to give the guarantees on the delay jitter in a work conserving scheduling disciplines. For this, we may need to go for the non work conserving scheduling discipline. As far as the delay bounds are concerned, the worst case delay bounds we can give provided the flows are rho sigma regulated. Okay. If the flows are not rho sigma regulated, then it may not be possible to give delay guarantees through a non first come first serve work conserving scheduling algorithms. By delay guarantees, I mean worst case delay bound. It may not be possible to give the worst case delay bound if the traffic is not regulated to rho sigma regulations. Uh, we would also like to have uh, one of the other attributes of the scheduling algorithms is that the scheduling algorithms must lead to a very simple admission control decisions. What does it mean? Typically, as we have seen that a traffic source will give or specify its traffic descriptors, which in internet are likely to be rho and sigma values and the quality of service attributes like the worst case delay bounds and so on. And then the network will try to see whether you know it can admit these flows or not. Now, when the network tries to see is that whether it can admit the flows or not, obviously the network is trying to see whether these flows, you know, by admitting these flows, it will not affect the quality of service guarantee. In other words, the network is trying to see that all the flows are schedulable, they become schedulable under the scheduling discipline which the particular network node is, is implementing. Okay? So, whether these nodes are uh, schedulable or not. So, then we need to define what is the schedulable region. Okay? So, so, let me just give you a definition of the schedulable region. Okay. The, the schedulable schedulable region, the set of all possible combinations of performance bounds that a scheduler can simultaneously meet is called schedulable region. Now, given a schedulable region, we can have a very simple admission control policy. Essentially, we need to see whether these you know performance bound, these set of performance bounds of the connections that we want to admit falls within the schedulable region or not. right? Because the schedulable region by definition is a set of all possible combinations of performance bounds that a scheduler can simultaneously meet. So, all we need to do is to characterize the schedulable region of a particular scheduling algorithm that we are deploying in the work conserving schedule, scheduling discipline. Okay? Now, it is sometimes very difficult to compute the schedulable regions of a scheduling algorithms, but if we can, if we can compute that, then the network will have a very simple admission control uh, policy. We will try to see uh, the schedulable regions of the certain scheduling algorithms that we will discuss 
in our subsequent discussions. Now, these are the various attributes of the scheduling algorithms that we have seen. One of them, it should be simple to implement, it should achieve fairness, it should give flow isolations, it should give quality of service guarantees, it should be uh, uh, scalable and uh, uh, it should uh, uh, also lead to some kind of a uh, simple admission control uh, mechanisms. Okay? Uh, it should it should give fairness we are saying that it should give fairness in the sense of maximum fairness that means it must maximize the minimum share of the bandwidth uh, it, which means that resources will allocated in the increasing order of demands so no user will get a, a resource larger than in demand and users whose demands are not fulfilled or not satisfied they all will get equal shares so this way you know we can ensure that the resources have been distributed to different users in a uh, so called fair manner okay now, there could be different definitions of fairness, but most scheduling algorithms that we are going to discuss are going to ensure, you know, this kind of uh, maximum fairness. Now, we would just like to see what are the degrees of freedom for implementing uh, scheduling algorithms. There are various degrees of freedom uh, for implementing uh, scheduling algorithms. One degree of freedom is that the priority, okay. Uh, now, what is the priority? The scheduling algorithms can can uh, uh, you know uh, divide these queues into low priority queues and high priority queues and so on. There could be various priority levels also: priority level one, priority level two, priority level three, and so on. Now, in a work conserving scheduling algorithms, if a priority level one is higher than all the other priority levels, then the scheduling algorithms will serve the packets from the priority level one only if there is uh, a packet in that queue. If there is no packet in the queue, then it will lead to the other priority levels. Obviously, uh, this might lead to starvation of the low priority users if the high priority users is all the time pumping the packets into it. So therefore, if we are implementing a priority kind of schedulers, then we must have some kind of admission control and traffic shaping which will ensure that the high priority users are not leading to starvations of the low priority users. It requires an admission control uh, uh, mechanisms. Uh, the other uh, uh, the other degrees of freedom that uh, scheduling algorithms uh, uh, can have is uh, whether it is a sorted uh, priority based uh, or whether it is some kind of a frame based. Okay, so th that is also I mean sorted priority based. Typically, each packet will be tagged with some kind of a service tag. So whenever a packet comes into the system, it is tagged with some kind of a service tag. Now, how do you compute the service tag is a different matter, but suppose these packets are tagged with service tags and then they are sorted, you know, in the order of those service tags and a scheduler will serve the packets in, in according to those service tags. So, these are sorted priority based. This could be frame based. By frame based, we mean that we define some kind of frame length, okay, fixed, this could be fixed frame or this could be variable length frame. Now, uh, the scheduler ensures that a maximum amount of traffic which can be sent by a flow within this frame is bounded. Okay, that is what the scheduler is trying to ensure. So, there is another you know degree of freedom uh, in terms of implementing a uh, scheduling algorithms. Then another third degree of freedoms that a scheduling algorithms can have in terms of degree of aggregations. Okay, whether uh, the various flows have been aggregated into one super flows okay uh, and then uh, the scheduler is scheduling uh, the uh, quality of service objectives or fairness objectives among these uh, aggregated flows okay so there are various pros and cons of the aggregations uh, that we would like to achieve at a network nodes okay uh, we can discuss that later but uh, uh, these are the uh, various degrees of freedoms which are available uh, in implementing a scheduling uh, algorithms. The next step that we would like to take is that given that these are the attributes of the scheduling algorithms and these are the various degrees of freedom that we have discussed today that a scheduling algorithm has and we would like to uh, have some kind of a no work conserving non first come first serve scheduling algorithms. What are the different scheduling algorithms uh, that are available today that are implemented in practice today that achieves uh, these desirable objectives. So, so that we will I'll uh, take up uh, in the uh, subsequent lectures.